When Imad left Stability AI, a lot of people thought the wheels would just completely fall off. Of course, now the CTO and the COO are effectively running the entire company, but it looks like that might not be the case because today Stability AI released Stable Code Instruct 3B, which is a model they released in alpha just about a week ago. They're calling this a new instruction to an LLM based on Stable Code 3B. But the difference here is with natural language prompting, the model can handle a variety of tasks such as code generation, math, and other software engineering related outputs much better. And what's impressive is they're claiming that this model's performance rivals models of similar or larger sizes, predominantly Code Llama 7B, Deep Seep Coder Instruct 1.3B, and in theory, what you can get out of Mistral 7B when you ask it to do coding things. So is Stability AI just blocking until they can actually release Stable Diffusion 3? Is this model actually usable, in my opinion, as a professional developer? Welcome to AI Flux, let's get into it. So I saw this on Twitter today and it seems pretty interesting. And one thing I'll say off the bat is their selection of languages was pretty interesting. It looks to me like a lot of this is meant to be kind of AI agents focused and less focused on a dedicated coding assistant, which we've seen done with Deep Sea Coder and a few other models from Meta as well. But let's jump into what Stability AI actually has to say about this model. So as far as release notes go for models from Stability, this one's actually pretty quick. We only get about a rough page of what's going on and it's kind of interesting. So what they say here is, again, Stable Code Instruct 3B is an instruction tune code LLM based on Stable Code 3B. And the whole idea here is this is supposed to do a better job of understanding what you want it to do explicitly rather than just being a generally capable coding LLM. The notion here is that you can tell it to manipulate something or go through a set of processes and it'll then be able to give you what you want. And obviously even GPT-4 struggles at times with this, so I'm curious how this model will actually perform once we start trying it out on Hugging Face. So specifically, what have they actually done to this model? So really what they claim here is that the model enhances code completion and supports natural language interactions, which of course, in theory, any LLM that you're giving input to has to have the ability to interact with natural language. Basically the idea here is that this model can ask back and clarify better than it existing versions. The other thing, obviously just having more general ability with natural language is efficiency and intuitiveness of programming. So again, the whole focus here is on software and kind of related math. Internally, they're claiming this outperforms a number of other models, but I kind of have my doubts, especially with a model this small. Now, you can tell why this is a 3 billion parameter model when you look at how narrow its focus actually is. So as opposed to certain things we've seen from Microsoft like Phi 2 or Deep Seek Coder, this model actually is only capable of using around six different languages. The predominant one obviously being Python, then followed by JavaScript, which is used by a bunch of web stuff, Java, C, C++, and Go. Go is a curious choice because the kind of design patterns you use with Go are quite different, whereas with Java, C, and C++, there's quite a bit of similarity, and JavaScript is kind of in the middle. Python is an obvious answer because the data sets um, surrounding Python available online and available in forums like Reddit and Stack Overflow, um, Python shows up a ton because it's a really popular beginner language. It also makes sense because people will probably use this mostly for Python anyway. When they talk about benchmarks, they say it, it delivers strong test performance even in languages that were not initially included in the training set, which is kind of interesting. Lua is not super surprising here because Lua is functional in nature and a lot of people would argue that Go is also a functionally kind of relevant language. So I'll ask a few Lua questions, I'll ask a few Lisp questions. And uh, when I went to college, Lisp was the basis of the entire CS program, which for those of you who don't know, is a, an entirely functional language. So it'll be curious to see how Stable Code Instruct 3B does with those kinds of other um, relatively simplistic functional languages. When they try to explain why this is, they say it may stem from its understanding of underlying coding principles and its ability to adapt these concepts across diverse programming environments, which also doesn't really mean much. That's a lot of words basically saying it guessed and it ended up being pretty much right. And if you asked me if I think a lot of these models understand design principles, I would say they roughly do, but they understand them through a bunch of examples, not necessarily kind of an architectural approach to what you would want to do. They also say that Stable Code Instruct 3B is not only proficient in code generation, but also fill in the middle tasks. And this is something that I wish was kind of mentioned more in a lot of benchmarks, especially on the open LLM leaderboard. Basically they say these are kind of database queries, code translation, explanations, um, this is also 
tightly coupled to documentation. And again, this is why I think this model is mostly intended to be used at scale, kind of as an AI agent or something that's small enough to run on a phone. Three billion parameter models are curious because a lot of times they're not useless, but they're kind of more useful as something that can just show a rough capability, not an actual kind of utilitarian capability. Like the kind of thing I would use every day as an actual assistant. For instance, it would be much better to use something like a 7 billion parameter model quantized down running on my MacBook than something like this. Although it is cool, it can run on a phone, but no one's really doing much coding on their iPhone anyway. And I will say, speaking of iPhones, I'm a little bit disappointed that no one has actually trained this up on Swift and what something I might try with one of these smaller models like this, this one actually in particular, is training it up on a bunch of Swift. And I will say one fun thing with models this small that happen to be like actually quite capable is they're way cheaper to fine tune and you can do a lot more cool experimentation with them while waiting around less to see if your experimentation actually worked which is pretty cool. So let's look at MT Bench. So they say here that in direct comparison with leading models like Code Llama 7B, Instruct, and Deep Seek Coder, Instruct 1.3B, why they're comparing to a model much smaller, I don't really know. They say that their testing is outlined in the technical report shows that stable code does pretty well. And I'm not gonna read this again because again, they've just said again that it does pretty well relative to these other models. So when we look at how it performs to older 15 billion parameter models, the performance is here. I will say I'm not that impressed that it beats Deep Sea Coder 1.6B Instruct. Other than that, the orgs that created Deep Sea Coder probably had much better data sets than Stability AI has access to. So in that regard, this is pretty impressive. I'll also say it's impressive that this is doing so much better than Code Llama 7B Instruct. However, again, Code Llama 7B in 2024, especially in late March, isn't exactly a state-of-the-art model. So they've kind of cherry-picked what makes this model look good, and I'll be curious if in my benchmarks this model actually proves up. This chart is kind of hard to read, but what I do think is cool is it shows again that Stable Code Instruct 3B is heavily, heavily biased towards Python. And again, in my opinion, this is because most data sets just have the most questions and examples on GitHub if you look at what's publicly available. Even if these companies claim to not have used GitHub to train on, Python is basically the most used language in public repos. So again, it's not really that surprising. And Rust is a really hard language, so that's not surprising. And JavaScript does a bunch of web stuff. So if you're going to showcase, like, make a website and create CSS, JavaScript is generally where you want to start with that. One thing that's also interesting that I will mention is they did mention the references for their training data sets. So ironically, they used a lot of stuff from GitHub, which explains why it was so Python heavy. They use Metamath and um, StarCoder data. And what's interesting is StarCoder has, at least the data set used to train that model, has been used pretty extensively. So it's interesting when you see differences in performance that are so big, which is kind of interesting. The last thing I want to kind of highlight here is what I would consider one of the things that Stability is best at, which is using very low level research to improve the efficiency and sort of procedures they use to train models that has given them so many wins over the last few months and the last year. So they show here that they're working on something called multi-stage training. They say that we employed a stage training approach that has been popular in other strong coding language models, such as CodeGen, Stable Code Alpha, Code Llama, Deep Sea Coder, and now in Stable Code Instruct 3B. They've also showed that they act that their starting point for all of this was actually Stable LM 3B, which is kind of interesting. They also employed quite a bit of pre-training, which is where a lot of their fill in the middle task basis in data was, which is kind of interesting. And what's cool is in theory, Stable Code Instruct 3B is really just the result of further instruct fine tuning on top of this stage training approach, building off of what initially created Stable Code 3B, kind of picking up where they left off in training. So I think this really highlights where a lot of the shortcomings of this model might be and why this model probably is pretty similar to Stable Code 3B. But obviously we'll have to actually check out how that is. Now, if you have any more questions about this technical report, um, please let me know in the comments below. I've actually had a lot of great discourse with people. And yeah, let's jump into Hugging Face and see what kind of Lisp and Lua and or Python we can have this model write. So I might have to eat my own words here because frankly, this model can completely write Lisp and functional languages. I might ask it some OCaml things because OCaml is a much more exotic and kind of lesser known language. But this is pretty cool. This is something that I would have had as like a assignment as you know, in the first few weeks of my CS degree. And this totally got it. It totally understands uh, nil 
and a lot of other kind of more common lists vernacular, which is kind of cool. So I'm gonna ask it something a little bit more complex and we'll see what we can get here. Here, It's actually pretty quick too. I was not expecting it to be as quick as it was because sometimes these smaller models take a little bit more time to think and really understand what you're asking. It understands kind of how to use pairs like that. And it's giving us an example. And it's actually doing a much better job of explaining this too. There have been smaller fine tunes of Phi 2 that I've used that have actually really struggled with this. And this is pretty cool. Try something in OCaml. We'll also try a few in Python just to see if the language it's most biased with also works well. So we'll do something that could kind of benefit from parallelism and we'll see if it understands where that can be applied. Now, frankly, I wouldn't be surprised if this had a really hard time trying to output OCaml because it's just such a hard language to learn and there aren't a lot of great examples. And a lot of the examples of it are actually Elixir or Erlang, which are other functional languages. So it's doing a lot of these kind of list comprehensions, which is interesting. So I'll, I will say it's writing OCaml kind of a inefficient way, but it did end up at a relatively correct solution, which is kind of cool. And yeah, so it like half rewrote merge sort, which is an interesting approach. And it got to the end of the output. What's also cool is the, the context window here seems to be pretty good. The other thing that's interesting with this model, having played around with it a bit, is it's actually pretty good at understanding um, runtime complexity as well, which is pretty interesting. Because a lot of these models kind of struggle with this. And so you guys know when I test these out, I don't really tell it to stop producing. I, I just let it run because I think it's interesting to see how far uh, or just how many tokens it's willing to put out after it does something. So what's cool is it explained a lot of things we maybe wouldn't have needed to know about logical operators in OCaml, but this is pretty impressive. I will say stability was not lying when they said that it was more capable outside of languages they picked to train initially on. The choice of Go is the most interesting one to me because C++ and C are pretty obvious. Um, Java is a rough equivalent to those. Python is quite interesting because Python is built on top of them. Although its design patterns can be functional or object oriented and choosing Go is pretty cool. And speaking of Go, I'm now going to ask kind of a general question about programming where uh, Go has this design paradigm of these things called Go routines. So they're basically like pipes. You can shove a lot of stuff down that kind of acts like cues, but they're used in a way that they're much faster. So let me ask, um, why would I want to use? So there isn't really a distinct answer here, and I'm hoping that it asks me what my application is because that's the most important question to ask whenever you're making a design choice in a program like this. It's how much time do you have? How observable or scalable does it need to be? And at the end of the day, does it just do what you want? So let's see what this says. Uh, okay, so, so it's a little confused here because Go routines aren't necessarily meant for parallelism. And obviously all of this is going on on the CPU. But for things like message passing, I think it's quite good. Um, go routines, it obviously, yeah. So what's interesting is clearly, the, and this is something that happens with smaller LLMs quite a bit, is it kind of got confused who it was talking to. So it prompted a number of questions, not really giving us an answer. And it kind of admits this because it says, I understand that the topic is relatively advanced, but it's important to understand the pros and cons of using Go routines in Go over threads in Python. So it kind of assumed that I was alluding to threads in Python, which frankly, I wasn't. And ironically, we get another insight into where it was maybe trained because it says, as there are, as there are multiple stack overflow questions asking about it, so please provide specific examples and explanations, um, which is, is basically, it's sort of lazy way of asking me, like I need more context to understand what you really mean. So one of my common questions here is just asking if it can generate the Mandelbrot set. So let's try that. And here we go. So still working a bit, but here we go. So it, this looks actually pretty good. And I like how it gives these conclusions at the end when you run this. Uh, it's code comments are not quite as good. But I like this, it says that this Python program generates a Mandelbrot set by generating a set of pixels. Interesting, okay, so this is actually kind of a recursive implementation. So it's not the most efficient and it's not memoized, but this is actually still pretty cool. And they're also showing us why you can run this without, okay, pretty good. Obviously it's resource intensive, that makes sense. And the big win here is it use NumPy. Sometimes these models don't do that and it's kind of interesting or they'll generate it but not give you a way to visualize it. 
which here they use matplotlib to actually do that. So pretty cool. So I'm curious, um, let me know in the comments below if you guys are actually going to be using this for AI agents or think that you would consider using this as kind of a coding assistant. I think this model is surprisingly capable, but I will say functional programming is a little bit easier to infer than more complex kind of specialized data structures, like for instance with GoRoutines, which this model did struggle with. Also, when you ask more nuanced questions, even though this model has a better handle on natural language, it needs as many details as possible to understand what it should give you. And again, it struggled when we were comparing Python threads to Go routines. So yeah, let me know in the comments if you would use this, if you thought um, there were some other things you want me to test it out with. I'm always open to suggestions. And as always, I hope you learned something in this video. If you like this video, please like, subscribe, and share. And we'll see you in the next one.